Welcome to People in Insurance. This podcast explores the mix of diversity, culture and tech innovations in our industry. Join us as we sit down with trailblazers, thought leaders and innovators who are reshaping the landscape of insurance, bringing you stories that redefine the narrative. We are your guide to the evolving landscape of insurance. This is People in Insurance, brought to you by Mackay. Welcome to People in Insurance. I am delighted to have Becky Glover with me today from Utree Insurance. Becky, thank you for coming on our podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a delight. (laughs) So I want to start by asking you about your co-finding of Elizabeth Rose Wines. Yeah, it's definitely the most sort of interesting part of careers, isn't it? When you uh, notice someone's co-founded something that's like super different to their day job. Um, So yeah, it was 2019 and um, it was, you know, we decided it was just a great idea, just something that we really wanted. So we thought, let's create it ourselves. And that idea was for one website that had lots of different vineyards, lots of different types of wine. But the kind of theme, the kind of niche we went for was we specialised in English and Welsh wine. Um, so still and sparkling. And what we really wanted to do was create a website, a platform where these really like small family owned, family run vineyards could sell their wines to a bit of a wider audience. Um, And it was something that we were super passionate about because it was all of these like labor of love um, farmers that were pouring everything into these wines. And yeah, we just absolutely loved it. Um, So we did that for five years, which, um, is a weird one because it almost feels like it was five minutes, but then in another thought you think, oh, actually, maybe it feels like it was 50 years. <laughs> um, and then in April of this year, we sold the business. Um, so it was an incredible journey doing everything from the initial idea all the way through to like designing the website, um, maintaining a website, Um, you know negotiating with vineyard owners who a lot of the time are farmers um, doing lots around marketing social media literally every area of business you can think of um, was just down to me and my other co-founder and so we learned a huge amount um, in a very short space of time it was one of those like well let's just do it and see if it works. Um, So yeah, that was five years, but we also still worked full time as well. So lots of juggling. Um, And then, yeah, we decided that actually for us, where we were personally, where the business was, actually it made a lot of sense to sell it to the buyer that we, we sold it to because they actually had a sort of bigger operation that they could take the business to the next level. Um, so it's really exciting to be part of that business's journey. And yeah, I think it's going to be incredible where they take it to. And I can't wait. And genuinely, I know a lot of people say like, oh yeah, but and they go, no, no, genuinely, I hope that they do incredible things for that because to be a little part of that business's journey is just going to be amazing. Oh, I wouldn't say little part, like it wouldn't <laughs> exist without you. So a fairly substantial part, um, I think. Yeah. But this this kind of um, way in which your uh, career, and I'm using it broader than your um, kind of day job, I'm using it as the entrepreneur yeah. as well. You've, you've kind of had quite rapid career progression uh, since leaving school, haven't you? So the rapidity, which is a word I think I'm going to coin for this um, yeah. <laughs> podcast, the rapidity of your um, entrepreneurial and um, professional journey has been quite astounding. Do you want to give us a bit of a background about who you are and what led to being your current role of financial director at Utree Insurance? Yeah, so um it it does feel quite quick sometimes when I talk about it, but when you live it, you think, oh my gosh, the, the day in, day out of sort of climbing that corporate ladder is, is quite challenging. So um, yeah, so I, um, going right back to the beginning, I left school when I was 17, so didn't complete my A-levels. Um, it just really wasn't sort of working for me, the whole school system. Um, I was a 
bit sort of agitated. I could never really focus. I just didn't really understand either how what I was doing for A-levels was going to translate into how I could go out into the real world and get a job that was meaningful and would actually sort of change my life and sort of like forge my life forward. So um, I left school at 17 and I had absolutely no plan um, what I was going to do, which you can imagine my parents were horrified. Um, But luckily, unluckily, (laughs) um, my father is an accountant. Um, So he kind of knew that route up into the profession. So that's kind of where I went for because I had no other view, no other option at that point. So I started off in a really small sort of local solicitors practice within their finance department. But to be honest, it was everything like making tea, making coffee, um, going and dropping the post at the post office photocopying um and there was some finance work but it was mainly you know could you go out and get that partner some lunch or you know all of the grunt work um but then I decided I really did need to try and get some sort of formal qualification in finance so I moved um and actually at that point I decided I don't have a level so don't obviously have a degree don't have any finance qualification so how am I going to get another job um all of the jobs were saying you know you must have a degree or it's a grad scheme or and certainly you know a a few years ago when I was in that role it wasn't really a thing to be an apprentice that wasn't just just wasn't really that popular it was definitely seen to be sort of the the plan b and you know if university failed for you so I just decided to write a load of letters um just kind of explaining to people what I wanted to do how I wanted to do it and why they should kind of just give me a chance so I sent those out I genuinely think I sent like 25 30 letters out to all of the local accountancy practices and I got like two replies or something um But it got me a job, got me a foot in the door. And they, I mean, it wasn't easy because they said, that's fine, we'll give you a chance. But for us to put you through the accounting qualification, you're going to have to do it through night school. So I would go and work full time. And then in the evening, I would go to um, accountancy college and learn sort of the, at that time, it was the AAT I was doing. So I did that qualification and then moved into a much bigger practice. So top 30 firm and did my ACCA qualification there. Then I decided I'm more than just accountancy. I need to get into a business. So I went and worked for a big listed biotech company, which was brilliant. Um, And then that sort of sparked my passion for the sort of tech piece. So then I went and moved and I was, excuse me, working for a startup. So completely different to a listed business. And again, that kind of sparked my interest in business because there was 19 of us at that point. Um, It was a software tech company and it was pretty much, you know, we've employed you so you you can get on and you know what you need to do because we don't know what you need to do so if you could just like do it (laughs) that would be great um so a lot different categorize the words that come out of my mouth on a daily basis when I'm thinking about (laughs) business and and um like you said all the different hats that you wear I'm like right yeah this is over to you you're the expert yeah. yeah. And I, I come from such structured backgrounds, you know, being in like big uh, accountancy practices and listed businesses. It's all very structured. You know, this is how we must do things. And I remember sitting there on my first day and it is like the films show you, you know, like it was a typical start that the offices weren't very nice. You know, we had missing ceiling tiles. We had very questionable stains on the floor, like dead bodies that were there or something you know? and then I just sat there and I was like I don't I don't know what I'm doing I, I'd literally been walked to my desk given a laptop and they said all right then so uh we'll, we'll leave you to it and I was just like leave me to what like what is this business <laughs> what am I doing here um so I remember actually saying to the CEO like uh, everyone's lovely I'm, I'm like really enjoying the atmosphere but I don't know what you want me to do and he turned around to me and was like no 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 like we were hoping you would tell us what to do it's like oh 
huge mindset shift. Um, but I loved it there. And so, yeah, I worked up the ranks there as the business grew and then, um, yeah, got to finance director when I was 29. But I was also doing loads of other things for that business. So all of the kind of operational stuff um, helped out with sort of people management side. And it was it was a massive role. Um, and then, yeah, moved to Utree about a year ago now. So still fairly new into insurance. Obviously, I've never touched this industry before. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really different to technology. But yeah, it's it's a great change. It sounds it. And I'm sort of wondering if there's anything you actually can't do. You sound like <laughs> Superwoman. Um, so hats <laughs> off to you entirely. Um, talk to me a little bit about... Um, I'm quite interested in the non-traditional educational path you took. Yeah. And I'm quite interested in how those early days of just going, ah, oh, right, apprenticeships, that's not really a thing. I'm just going to write letters. The strength and the mindset to, uh, for an, an individual, and I've got a 15-year-old daughter, so I'm thinking of a 17, 18-year-old um, person. That is, a, that is a strength of character and a focus that is, not always present in that age group how has that kind of shaped you or was that who you were and that's then shaped how how you've ended up where you are so do you know what I mean yeah and I, I don't know where that comes from so I and I had never actually really picked up on that until a few years ago when people said you know you're just making stuff happen though and I was like well I'm, I'm not really I'm just asking can I do that or can I be involved in that or whatever it is and there was, you know, that person was saying, but people don't do that. They wait for the opportunity to come to them. And I thought, well, that's, you know, that's boring. <laughs> How is anything ever going to change if you wait for that? So, um, yeah, I don't know where that comes from. I think I've just always had it in me that if you want something, you can just go and ask for it, but not expect to have it, but to learn it. I'm just, I have always had this mindset that, I just really want to learn how to do things and I'm very interested in a certain area and I just want to learn everything about it and then I can take that knowledge and apply it slightly to another area but learn a little bit more um and I think that's why I just love business because it's so different it's so broad and every business is different they have different people different strategy different industry whatever it is and so yeah, I think I'm just fairly lucky that that just seems to be sort of ingrained in me somehow. Um, and I just try and make things happen for myself. And I think that's the biggest thing is I never expect anyone to be able to, you know, do anything else for me. I'm I'm here to just do it for myself. So I love that. I absolutely love that. And I have a similar mindset myself, which um, sometimes gets me into trouble. Um, <laughs> but I'm thinking particularly from a parenting perspective with a, uh, my daughter at the moment and, and she's about to do a GCSEs, the school system's not working for her, blah, 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 blah. There's a big societal expectation and I think the change, I think it's been very different. So I think perhaps when we were younger or I think you were younger, I'm older than you, um, that you said there wasn't much apprenticeships and um, there was a, a, a different societal expectation. And I think there was a different societal expectation around women, particularly. Now I'm seeing um, another societal expectation that I think is different, but I still think there's problems with it. You, mm. You've got to follow the traditional path. You've got, um, you know, there are too many young people for jobs and, um, the you know the the in, the economy's really ruined and how are they ever going to get out and buy a house and how are they ever going to do this how are they going to do that mm. how what advice would you give to my daughter now who finishes mm. her GCSEs hopefully in May and I don't think college is for her she is extremely bright but she's not in this box and she yeah. needs something else what what would your advice be well I think that's the perfect place to be to be honest because if you think about being employable employers don't want someone to come in and do one task and then go home again like that's all great for a small amount of time but actually if you want to get your teeth stuck into things and add some value to a business and help grow that business um so i think actually just to start with i think as a bit of a confidence piece you know kids are still told you go to school you do your a levels you go to university and then you come out and you get a job 
and it's not that easy and you do have to make things happen for yourself but I think the key takeaway for any sort of younger person is to have confidence in what they wanted to do I didn't have confidence to leave school I I didn't think that was probably the right way to do it because everyone was saying you got to get a degree and whatever and got to do well in that degree and then you've got to go and know what job you want to do you don't need to know what job you want to do at all you can have some fun with it but I think the thing that people need to realize is that it's it is on them to figure that out. Um, you can't you know, sit at home and expect someone to offer you a job or expect someone to hand you this incredible career path that's just laid out perfectly for you. Um, so it's all about challenging yourself. And I think that's absolutely fine to feel like you don't know what you're going to do and you're sort of swimming in this big sea and there's no direction. Um, but the hardest part is just to start and to figure out as much as anything what you don't enjoy doing. And it's absolutely fine to go do you know what I just don't really enjoy that bit but I do enjoy this bit so I'm going to follow that a little bit further and see where that takes me and I think also you need to start getting some stuff on your CV you need it's all about what you as an individual can add value to an employer um because that's all businesses are I always say to people you know businesses are just a group of people hopefully doing the same thing in the same direction to grow that business and to make it more valuable so what are you as an individual bringing to the table um so for young people it should be amazing for them to go and get some work experience somewhere doing something interesting for them um or going to events so trade events so personally my cousin has just come out of um university she just graduated she doesn't really know exactly what she wants to do but she just came to a big accounting conference with me accountex in manchester um so she could start to talk to people start to make some connections understand the challenges of those people understand what businesses they work in so it's all about learning but that never ends right you know we're all still learning that's what I love about podcasting is I learn something on every single um, podcast conversation that I have and yeah. it's not always about insurance sometimes it's about people sometimes it's um, you know more subjective like something will slot into place that I've already been thinking about and I, I find it absolutely fascinating um, you've so accountancy is a relatively um male dominated industry as is software um, yeah. as traditionally insurance has been though you see changes you know everywhere what's what's that been like for you yeah um i mean it's not always particularly plain sailing easy um but i think you can look at it in two different ways you can look at it as you know maybe a bit more of a victim mindset uh, people like to recruit people like themselves and you know maybe i'm i'm not a middle-aged man so it's going to be harder for me or you can look at it as well i'm different i do stand out from the crowd so if there's a room full of um men well at least people will remember me because i was a woman <laughs> um and i think just naturally i've always just found it absolutely fine to hold my own in those sorts of situations I do think you have to be fairly robust because there's always going to be you know the one comment from the, the one person that's you know it's a joke or it's banter or whatever they want to call it but and you do have to kind of push through that and um be able to I guess give it as you know give as good as you get um in those situations but I think we do need to almost look at it from a, a positive point of view sometimes we have a load more or a load more but maybe different as well skills um we've seen a lot of different things and actually even if it just gives us a little bit more grit and determination to get up in that sort of male dominated industry um that can only be a good thing i like that i like that a lot and actually um I often like we, this conversation often comes up and I I don't necessarily think it's a male female thing I think it's a people thing like yeah. I've in you know past careers had um, some uh, relationships at work that were extremely negative and they weren't men yeah. um, so I, I just think it, it's about people and like you said it's about mindset and it's about how you want to 
um, challenge yourself and mm. focus yourself, I suppose. Um, one of the things I've noticed about you in a really <laughs> lovely way is that you <laughs> uh -oh. are really good on social media and marketing. And that doesn't necessarily, people don't go, oh, finance director, marketing. Those two yeah. things don't really go together in a traditional sense. So talk to me a little bit about how social media has helped you in your career marketing kind of self-branding and what what how it's kind of helped you challenge any of the stereotypes and things like that yeah and the social media sort of side of things is just something that I've really enjoyed doing and I think this goes back to um, my thought previously where I'm saying you know businesses are just people and I just really enjoy people um, sort of understanding people figuring out like what they're going through at the moment what they've been through learning from their experiences because that can be really valuable and so I think yeah lots of people say to me you know you go to all of these different events and, and they sort of think of social media personal branding networking whatever sort of area you want to call it as a chore but I actually really enjoy it because I think how can you understand businesses and different kinds of businesses if you can't understand the people that are in there um so yeah like it's very busy it's very full-on and I like to share all of that on my socials because I think it might give people the kind of confidence to go to those events or the kind of confidence to put out their ideas and their sort of thoughts on social media as well um but generally it's something that I just really enjoy doing because I just love the sort of people element of businesses and yeah that's typically not what you would expect from someone in finance um but I always always go on about the fact that finance is not a back office function or it shouldn't be finance if you're doing it right should be a front office commercial function helping to build businesses not just report on what's happened last month or last quarter like that's the real kind of basic side of finance and really what finance strategy finance innovation should be doing is spotting the opportunities for that business which means you need to go out and you need to talk to people um and then using those so using the bigger picture turning it into sort of smaller ideas taking it back to your business and going have we thought about this maybe that's how we can move the needle um let's maybe do a little bit more of that a little bit less of this let's test it out see what happens um so yeah for finance is a very broad area and a lot of things happen under the kind of umbrella of finance um but for me it's there's a massive importance on data um and testing and seeing what what sort of happens a lot of what you're talking about is kind of subliminally about inspiring and being inspired so i've heard you talk about helping grow businesses looking for opportunities bringing back what you've learned learning from other people but also um being a bit of a role model, I suppose, to uh, younger generations that maybe aren't taking a traditional path or uh, have you got any kind of stories or examples of where either you've been really inspired, you know, a particular light bulb moment or somebody's come to you and said, you know, Becky, you really inspired me in this particular way? I had um, something really recently, actually. So obviously it's not been that long since we had results day and you know poor parents agonizing over what their child might be able to do and what those results might be and obviously the huge amount of stress that those children have as well but yeah I met um a gentleman at a networking event we got talking about my kind of route into the industry and he can sort of just did, wasn't really aware that you could do an apprenticeship in finance and that leads you to sort of senior positions within finance. Um, so I talked him through it. And one of the things that I do um, is I sit on the council on the board of the AAT, so the um, Association of Accounting Technicians. And that's kind of where people come into the industry. So I talked him through that whole route and what that qualification does, what it means, what kind of doors it opens for you. Um, and he took that away. And then I got a message from him actually saying, 
that was absolutely incredible that conversation and I've only met this man once or twice I think and he said that conversation led us to believe that our son could do that route and that actually be really good in that route um and I got a message from him saying he secured his friendship secured an amazing position in this amazing company and he's already sort of flying and enjoying it so that is an, is enough for me to feel like I've kind of I mean that's given your bow back. out moment isn't it I have yeah. given um wow that is just incredible that is so incredible I might um see if you want to have a conversation with my daughter um, yeah absolutely <laughs> maybe you can do a podcast with her. I think that would be really interesting yeah a podcast to like mentoring kids yeah that would be really good actually we because there's so much information out there finance yeah. yes yeah that would be All right, good. there's an idea. There a you copyright go. it or whatever you need to do. If <laughs> you're listening to this, don't steal my <laughs> idea. Our idea, shall I say. Um, so technology and insurance. Yes. You've got um, lots of experience in technology and insurance is relatively new. The numbers for a business are the numbers yep. and every business is a collection of people aiming towards the same goal, yep. as you've said. Um, so. Um, what learnings have you taken from the technology sector and, uh, th that you're bringing to um, the insurance sector without giving away Utree's wonderful uh, Secret secrets source. and things that they may or may <laughs> not be doing? Yeah, well, I think working in the sort of insurance, uh, working in this sort of technology area was really eye opening and I really enjoyed it because it's really agile. It's really sort of fast paced. It's really interesting. And in that sector it's not really about who you are or what you've done before it's about what ideas you've got and where you're going next and the kind of confidence within those businesses is all about let's just test it and see like who knows if it's a good idea but let's do a product maybe a minimal viable product and let's just see what happens and actually a lot of the time it's not that one idea that one product that goes on to be something amazing but it's the things you learn from it and you can iterate it and tweak it and make it into something brilliant so I think that as a mindset is really important and then so having that sort of industry experience and then being in the finance element of that um, has been really important because a lot of the software providers that are creating technology for finance teams are doing some really great stuff at the moment. There's loads about automation, uh, machine learning, AI, no, uh, softwares that will scan invoices for you and automatically read it. And uh, they're doing some really great stuff. And it is almost at the point now where if you're not using technology within a finance team, you'll be left behind in five minutes. Um, so that's super important. The data then that you get out of that is really important. So you can advise the business that you're working in what they should be doing more or less of. Um, so that's really sort of key. But now what I would like to see is the insurance sector bringing that in as well. Um, I think actually one thing that people miss from embedding technology into their businesses is the impact it has again on their people because a lot of people don't want to be doing boring tasks repetitive tasks so actually if you can automate that somehow or use some ai to give you some prompts or whatever it might be that will actually increase your staff morale they'll be able to think they'll be able to be a little bit more human in their work and a little bit more strategic and actually the value that that gives your end clients and the business um is absolutely massive so yes we we will see what the sort of insurance world does with technology over the next few years but it's it could be an, a huge area for business growth but also keeping our people happy absolutely love it look you are an absolute powerhouse right you've got a wonderful career you've got an incredible mindset a huge um uh, skill set and a, you are a very successful human right how how do we how do we redefine or to use our phrase change the conversation mm -hmm. about um women successful women in the workplace how can you have your cake and eat it and have 
the family and have the successful career and have everything without having the mental breakdown? How, how do we support that? Because you see it all the time. Yeah. You see women have made a choice and some men have made a choice or their choices to, to try and balance. And it is a struggle. And I include myself in this. Please give me some great advice. <laughs> um, do you know, I think we've taken on a lot as as women, as individuals, as you know, as as humans, as you say, but I think it's okay to not do it all. So we need to give ourselves permission. We can have it all, we can want it all, but we don't have to do it all. So for me personally, I think there is huge um, sort of benefit, but gain confidence in knowing that, yeah, maybe you want a brilliant family life or a lovely home life, but also you want an amazing career where you travel and, and do all these great things. So you can have all of that, but you won't do all of it yourself. So start delegating some bits out, you know, at work, if you get to a senior position, you're not expected to do that senior position and do all of the roles underneath it. So why is it that in the home, we still expect ourselves to do the senior position and do everything underneath it that we used to have time for. So I think it's really important to not look upon any kind of help or delegation, if you want to use sort of a corporate word in a negative way. I think we should absolutely normalise the fact that we need support systems around us. And the more I talk to extremely successful women, the more I realise they all have a very, very robust support system around them, but no one talks about it. Um, no one talks about the fact that they have a personal trainer and a stylist and a housekeeper and a nanny and, you know, all of these different things. They People just see them turning up for work, looking incredible, having their, you know, life together and they go, well, why can't I be like that? Like, why am I so awful? And all of the negative thought processes that come in. And it's like, well, that person isn't just that person. They have a huge amount going on around them and said so that's okay if you're not feeling the same way she's looking because maybe you don't have that support system yet or maybe you don't want that and that's absolutely fine but we must be honest with ourselves that you can have it all but you can't do it all and neither should we expect people to do it all it's just no way shape and form like that's the title happen. you can have it all but you can't do it all that is yeah. the title of this podcast <laughs> uh, I've just made that decision now because I think it's a fabulous uh, I think I think it's I think it's brilliant and I think it's um quite a refreshing mindset uh and like you say you you don't you don't you don't do everything in a workplace yeah um or you shouldn't it's a lesson <laughs> I'm learning control freakery to delegate <laughs> and um uh um and trust but you know, maybe you need to look at building that. Maybe I need to look at building that um, more thoroughly in your, in my kind of home life. And maybe yeah. that's the balance. And not everybody is able to have, you know, all the paid additional help. But and not everyone wants support to. systems. Yeah. No, but also support systems doesn't mean a stylist always. No. It might mean really good friends and neighbours yeah. and family around. Um, yeah. So I find that really interesting. Um Okay, I'm going to finish by asking you, how do we start recognizing and celebrating women's career mind stole, blah, 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 stones <laughs> in um, professional settings? Like what, what yeah. is it we can do and how can we bring in what you've just said about recognizing the support network that is mm -hmm. also supporting those milestones yeah and this is something that really gets to me actually <laughs> um because when people get engaged when people get married when they buy their first home have a baby whatever it is all of those sort of life events there's a party there's a celebration or there's all of this kind of joy that surrounds it but in a professional setting, okay, maybe you 
go out for a few drinks if you get promoted. But what happens if you, you know, take a risk and invest in a business or start up your own business? Or what if you've gone on a training course and you've like just met these amazing people? Or, you know, all of those kind of events that happen in a professional setting, we're not celebrating them as we do personal events. And I think it's so tricky to try and get this balance right. But people make life decisions in different areas. And maybe some people want the big family and that sort of area. And so we're celebrating when people have children or whatever, but maybe some women don't want that. Maybe they want to be celebrated when they start up their next business or go for that next C-suite role, whatever it might be. I think there needs to be an equal level of celebration because it is equally important to those two people in that situation. Um, so I think that just lands to the people that we're supporting. So we need to be aware that when someone starts up their next business, we need to be there for them. We need to be championing them as we would if they were doing, you know, buying their first home, whatever it might be. So, and that's on us, that's on us to change because we need to say, let's celebrate that. That's a big thing. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a really key thing that we need to be doing um, and just realizing that everyone's journey is completely different and that's absolutely fine. But what experiences and what exposure have you had along the way? And that's what creates the person and the value that they're going to bring to your life and your business. You're a very, very wise lady. <laughs> very wise. Um, I have really enjoyed chatting to you. I could talk to you all day. Um, and you. I definitely think we have scope for at least another 75 podcast episodes because I've Let's had all of get those it in the diary. whilst we've yeah. been chatting. Let's absolutely do it. Thank you very much for your time. You're awesome. Thank you. Thank you for your time. It's been amazing. It's just been a nice chat with um, with a friend and we've just been setting the world to rights on some things and sort of getting ourselves geared up for the next. are amazing. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. Thank you very much. Speak soon. Thank you for tuning in to another enlightening episode of People in Insurance. If you enjoyed today's insights and want to stay connected with the latest industry trends, be sure to subscribe, rate and leave a review. Feel free to reach out to us on social media or through our website to share your thoughts and suggestions or even to nominate someone whose contribution deserves to be heard. Until next time, signing off from People in Insurance. <laughs>